Retro game prices are absolutely insane right now. I went on eBay today to look up a copy of Billy Hatcher and the Giant Egg for GameCube. It's a game I had a while back. I wanted to play it again. And that thing in good condition is going for almost a hundred bucks. Like you can find copies for 60 bucks or whatever with some scratches on the disc. But even that, I sold my copy for I think 30 bucks a couple years ago. And then I was looking at another post on Facebook where somebody traded two N64 games for an Earthbound. Uh, the Earthbound ended up being fake and people were like, well, what did you get for it? And he traded a GoldenEye 007 and Super Mario 64 for it. And I'm like, oh, that wasn't that much. And then I read the comments and somebody was like, $90 in games for a fake? I'm like, $90 for GoldenEye 007 and Super Mario Brothers 64? Are you kidding me? Like, what kind of price is that for those games? GoldenEye was $10, uh, Super Mario 64 was $25 for the longest time. But prices are just through the roof. Not even on just super retro consoles, we're talking about Wii is insane. $30 for Wii Sports? Everybody's just sitting home during the pandemic, you know, buying these games up. Then there's a game that I've been expecting to go up in value for years, but it always sat at $100, $150, and it's finally shot up in price, and that's the Turok Rage Wars Grey cartridge for N64. Prices for that game are now climbing towards the $400 range, which I honestly expected that years ago, but it's finally happening. It's like all these prices are going up. So what does that mean for me and the NES Complete in Box Quest? Really? Nothing. I've been collecting these games. I've been finding killer deals, uh, good lots for cheap prices. Um, I've been getting good deals on the rare games, everything. So it's like everything else is going up in price, but I've still been finding the deals on NES. So it's really not affecting me much at all. But it's just insane to see some of the prices out there for Wii, GameCube, Nintendo 64. It's, it's just crazy. But today we have seven games that we'll be adding to the collection and this is continuing the lot of 34 for the NES Complete in Box Quest. Let's check them out. And the first game we have up is Double Dragon 2. Double Dragon 2 was developed by Technos Japan and hit store shelves in 1988. Double Dragon 2 is a beat-em-up. This was the second Double Dragon game on the NES and it made some improvements. One huge improvement is being able to play multiplayer with both characters on the screen at the same time. The game is complemented with good music and fun gameplay. The controls are great as well, but they take some getting used to. For example, pushing R and A will punch towards the right, but pushing R and B will kick backwards to the left and vice versa. Once you master the controls, it's a really neat mechanic. The visuals in the game are excellent as well. There is a lot of detail in the backgrounds and sprites. Other than punching and kicking, you can do all kinds of combos. You can knee people in the face, throw enemies, and do jumping spinning kicks. On top of that, you can pick up weapons enemies drop and use them too. However, the weapons disappear when a new type of enemy enters on the screen. It's amazing how many different moves you can do with a D-pad and A and B button. If you're a fan of beat-em-ups, Double Dragon 2 is a must-have for your collection. And Double Dragon 2 is game number 32 for the collection. And the next game we have up is Golf Grand Slam. Golf Grand Slam was published by Atlas and released for the NES in 1991. I've played a lot of golf games on different systems. Most have some type of power meter when swinging at the ball. Golf Grand Slam is the most oddball golf game I've played, but it works and I like it. Rather than just trying to make a meter stop or multiple meters stop in the right place, Golf Grand Slam does things completely different. You have a ton of options to choose from. You choose your club, your stance, the ball position, the angle of your golf swing, the tee height, and even how you grip the club. Once you have the shot lined up the way you want it, you're ready to swing. A golf ball appears with a small dot rapidly moving in multiple directions. You hit A to stop the small dot and that's when you hit your ball. If you didn't do a good job centering it, your shot will be thrown off. At first the system seemed really weird, but I was consistently making pars and birdies in the game. The one thing I can't stand about the game is the music. It sounds like it should have been a Castlevania game. 
It's super intense and doesn't feel like it belongs in the game. I wasn't sure if I was playing a golf game or about to fight some ghost in a floating statue head. The game offers a tournament mode and a practice mode so you can get good at the game. Practice mode lets you reshoot each shot as many times as you want, so it's easy to learn. There are a lot of golf games on the NES we still have to cover, but if you're looking for a fun golf game on NES, give Golf Grand Slam a try. Golf Grand Slam is game number 33 for the NES Complete in Box Library. And the next game we have up is Star Soldier. Star Soldier was developed by Hudson Soft and published by Taxon. It flew onto store shelves in 1989. Star Soldier is a shoot 'em up game and the first in the series of the Star Soldier games. Some of the later games released in the Star Soldier series include Soldier Blade, which is my favorite shmup of all time, and Star Soldier Vanishing Earth, which we covered on the N64 Complete in Box Quest. You can see the similarities in all the games. The level designs look similar, there is a midway boss and an end boss, and plenty of power-ups for your main weapon along the way. The music in the game is decent, but it doesn't compare to the outstanding music in later titles of the series. The gameplay has some interesting mechanics. You fly undercover to avoid enemy fire. However, you cannot return fire when undercover. You can also lose sight of your ship, making you pop out and lose your ship when you emerge. If you're using a standard controller, prepare to give your thumb a workout because you'll constantly be tapping the A button to fire. You'll want to play this game with the Max controller or NES Advantage. The game also lacks bombs or different main weapon types. There's nothing to get you out of tight situations. You can find warps in the game, which advance you to further levels. This is the first shmup I can recall playing that had that feature. The graphics in the game are good and the gameplay is okay, but there are much better shmups in the series and on the NES. Unlike those games though, Star Soldier on the NES won't shoot a hole in your wallet. Star Soldier is game number 34 for the NES Complete in Box Quest. The next game we have up on the list today is Taboo, Taboo, The Sixth Sense. Taboo The Sixth Sense was developed by Rare and published by Trade West. It released for the NES in 1989. When it comes to scary games on the NES, games like Castlevania, Friday the 13th, and Zombie Nation come to mind. Those games aren't really scary though because of the graphical limitations of the system. But a game that can truly give you the creeps on the NES is Taboo The Sixth Sense. Taboo is a tarot card reading game that claims to be the time machine of Nintendo. You start off by entering the state you live in, inputting your name and birthday, and whether you're a male or female. After that you ask the game a question and it goes into a trippy card shuffling sequence as you await the answer. I input one question, is Taboo a good game? It answered, the situation at present is enjoy the good things in life whilst they are available. But it's almost like the game can read your mind too. I was sitting there thinking if people actually like my videos. <laughs> <laughs> and if I'd ever break a thousand subs on YouTube. <laughs> Where do I come up with this stuff? But it's almost like the game can read your mind too. I was sitting there thinking if people actually like my videos. And if I'd ever break a thousand subs on YouTube. The game responded to my thoughts saying, Recent past factors are a period of disappointment. Oh thanks Taboo. In reality the game is a set of systematically set responses that can apply to anybody's life or situation. However, play if you dare. I'll leave this game boxed and on the shelf and hope the evil spirits stay in the circuit board. Taboo The Sixth Sense is game number 35 for the collection. Next up we have Dash Galaxy and the Alien Asylum. Dash Galaxy and the Alien... 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 Dash Galaxy and the Alien... 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 Alien. In the alien. 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 <laughs> alien Asylum. So stupid. Why can't that just flow? Next up we have Dash Galaxy in the Alien Asylum. Dash Galaxy was developed by Beam Software and published by Data East. It released for the NES in 1990. Dash Galaxy is a platforming game where you control a character named Dash. You start off on floor zero and you find yourself in a room full of blocks. The blocks must be moved to enter each level. Once you enter, you'll find yourself going across the side-scrolling level. You collect switches to open the door back to the main floor. But you also need to find keys and bombs in the levels to advance through the game. Once you complete all the levels on a floor, you enter an elevator and go to the next. 
Each main floor has simple puzzles that must be solved to enter the levels. If you don't find keys and bombs in the same levels, you won't be able to reach the other levels. However, you can skip some floors and levels altogether, but you don't know which levels are relevant and which aren't. The whole time you're playing in the levels, your oxygen supply is gradually decreasing. If your oxygen supply depletes all the way, you die. Hitting enemies can also drain your oxygen supply quickly. Like the levels, the main floor also has an oxygen level. So it's essentially like a time limit to beat all the levels. The game gets a lot of bad reviews, but I don't think it's that bad of a game once you get over the awkwardness of controlling Dash. Apparently the game can be frustrating because if you get to floor 9, you're stuck with no escape. You have to find an earlier warp that sends you to the 10th floor instead. That would be pretty frustrating, but I haven't made it that far in the game yet. I do plan on coming back to this game and exploring it more. Dash Galaxy in the Alien Asylum is game number 36 for the NES library. And the next game up is Spy vs. Spy. <coughs> Spy vs. Spy was developed by First Star Software and published by Kimco. It released for the NES in 1988. Spy vs. Spy is a game based on a comic from Mad Magazine. That explains why the end label of the game says Mad, rather than the actual name of the game. The goal of the game is to collect all items needed to get on a plane and leave. You need a key, passport, money, and a secret paper. To carry all these items, you will need to find a briefcase as well. Once you have the briefcase with all the items, you exit the level through the plane door and take off finishing the level. If you try to leave before you have all the items, you die. The levels are each on a timer. When you die, you lose time off the timer. You can die by trying to leave the level without all the items, running into booby traps, or by fighting the other spy. You can fight the other spy in the game, but the combat isn't great. The best way to take out the other spy is to hide booby traps. You can hide booby traps in the furniture to take out the other spy. The levels can be played in any order. The higher the level, the more rooms there are to search, and the more booby traps there are. The music and gameplay is repetitive, but the game is fun in short spurts. And Spy vs. Spy is game number 37 for the collection. And the last game we have up today is a brutal game, and that game is Cybernoid the Fighting Machine. Cybernoid was published by Acclaim and it released for the NES in 1989. If you're looking for a brutal game, this is it. In this shmup, each screen brings you destruction. You will die time after time again. Every screen presents its own madness. Sometimes you enter a screen, and you die before you can even see what's going on. Guiding the Cybernoid requires precision. If you even tap an obstacle, your ship will blow up. You start out with 9 lives, but they go quick. You have a main laser weapon with various sub-weapons when you start. A fires the main weapon and B fires the secondary weapon. At least sometimes. The B button is unresponsive a lot of the time. You'll see your weapons deplete, but nothing happens on the screen. To top it off, not only the enemies kill you, but you blow up if you get hit by your own special weapon. After you use up your 9 lives, it's game over. Yeah, it's just like putting a cat in a drying machine. You go through nine lives quick. There is no music during the gameplay. It's just the sound of destruction. The best part of the game is the graphics. The game looks really good visually. Other than that, prepare to take a beating when you put in Cybernoid. And Cybernoid is game number 38 for the NES Complete in Box Quest. Again, we'll be putting these games on the shelf when we cover all 34 games in the lot. If you enjoyed the video, please make sure to subscribe. I'll be completing the entire NES library, complete in box, right here on this show. Also, make sure to leave a thumbs up for Double Dragon 2. Until next time, I'm Wayne, and thanks for watching.